Hello friends, welcome to my channel. Today I want to talk about the principles that I am following when building a platform, when setting up a platform engineering team and what are the best practices and why it differs from an approach that is not necessarily following the uh, platform engineering culture idea and, and so on. So um, the, the reason why I'm making this video is because at work I found it useful to explain the importance of these principles because there are subtleties that require a completely different design if you want to enable platform engineering and if you want to especially enable autonomy in the in the d development teams here i try to condense most of the thinking behind platform engineering most of the philosophy behind platform engineering in a limited set of principles very likely i'm missing something but let me list first the principles and then we can see them one by one so principle number one ability to rebuild the platform from scratch Principle number two, ability to delegate operations and maintenance. Principle number three, keep the platform as a build time dependency. Number four, platform does not hide ops from development teams. Principle number five, make sure every decision is um, reversible and everything is versioned. Now let's start from the first one, ability to reproduce the platform. So why this is the first principle? This is the first principle because it's the first thing you have to keep in mind when you are designing any component in, in your platform. Why? First of all, we are in the cloud and anything can happen, right? So we don't have direct control. This is a good practice also if you are on-prem, not necessarily on the cloud, but on the cloud there are even less things that you can control. So it's more a mandatory practice, right? So essentially what you want to do, you want to answer the question, what's going to happen if my cloud provider is down. Can I rebuild the entire platform? What if my region is down for a week? Can my business survive for a week in that situation? Probably not. So you need to have a contingency plan where you can rebuild your platform somewhere else. Somewhere else, maybe on the same cloud provider and even more complicated if you want to do on a different cloud provider. Essentially, it's for disaster recovery. The other thing is when you design things with the ability to be rebuilt, um, you need to exercise this ability because it's very easy, especially when using infrastructure as code, that during the evolution of your platform, you create dependencies in your code where what already exists evolves and starts using something that wasn't in place at the beginning when you created your platform. So this, you are creating a kind of a temporal dependency and the circular dependency with your resources in the cloud. So this is uh, this is absolutely essential when you have to define your uh, disaster recovery plan. Remember that also a disaster recovery plan needs to be exercised. So having the ability to exercise it regularly is also saving you lots of time down the road because at one point, for, for one reason or the other, it depends on your industry, you may have to show that your ability to rebuild everything, so to, to um, um, validate your disaster recovery plan. One thing I generally suggest is to have your platform and have a, a way to rebuild it. So you create an isolated environment that is specifically for this type of testing. And on a weekly basis or on a daily basis, it's up to you. You destroy everything that you create. So why is it important to do it frequently? Because if you do, for example, on a weekly basis, you can only introduce a circular dependency in a week. So reverting or changing the work that happened in one week, is gonna be relatively cheaper than doing it after six months, right? So if you introduce circular dependency and then you build upon that circular dependency, you will have lots of headaches trying to revert your code with minimal impact. So if you do this on a regular basis, you have a constant validation of your uh, source code and it's um, it's much easier to validate not just your circular dependencies but also the apis from the cloud provider that you are hitting so doing this is is um, uh, extremely valuable and uh, we saved ourselves in uh, in uh, various situations by implementing such approach okay now let's move on with principle number two Principle number two is the ability to delegate operations and maintenance. What do I mean with this? So when you start a new platform, generally you start with a very small team 
that has a um, clear focus, they know exactly what they want to implement and they can uh, start immediately, right? So that team, most of the time, has complete access over the cloud resources. This situation generally is not sustainable for a long period. So what happens is that after a while, once the, you have the first version of, the, of your um, platform, you need to think about expanding and you have a need for uh, maybe adding more people to the team. With team increasing in size, you end up with uh, a number of problems. So you have to split the teams, have different teams. You also may want to uh, define a little bit better what are the roles and responsibilities of each team. And uh, if everything has been created with, by one team without considering the option to delegate operations and maintenance, you will end up with always um, a responsibility shared across two teams. Every time you have this situation where multiple entities are responsible for one thing, you end up with conflicts. So the way I try to do this is try to be as strict as possible early on with the principle of least privilege. You may say, why the principle of least privilege? Because by splitting the responsibilities you are also splitting the access the, and uh, the principle of least privilege is exactly that is trying to give people just enough permissions to do the operations that they need so in this way segregating and moving pieces of infrastructure of code into other areas of your business is much much easier so keeping this principle in mind so the ability to delegate operations and maintenance is going to help you with uh, with all these things so a more concrete example, let's say today you have one platform team, tomorrow your platform team will be divided in multiple areas. So one focusing on security, one focusing on identity and access management, one focusing on compute, one focusing on uh, uh, databases. So you don't need to have all these, all of them being on me, right? So you want to reduce the scope. By reducing the scope, you're going to have all your processes inside your organization, especially if you're working on heavily regulated environments, uh, being way more lean because you can simply state in your change management process that the risk is much lower simply because some of the uh, concerns don't apply because the user operating your platform doesn't actually have the permissions to damage a specific part of the platform. So you can immediately de-risk a lot of situations. So hopefully I made this clear why this principle is important. So now moving on on the principle number three, keep the platform as a build dependency. What do I mean with build dependency? So when you create a platform, you can decide about having the platform as a build time dependency or a runtime dependency. What is the difference between these two? If you have the platform as a build time dependency, it's only used to provision the resources that you need, that developers need, uh, to build their application and to evolve their application. If you keep the platform as a run runtime environment, you immediately become a, a, a live component. So if your platform is down, your application is down. Decoupling this thing is another important aspect because we'll allow platform team to evolve their product with less friction and it's going to be uh, a little bit easier to have a window where developers are not operating, where you can have downtime, uh, where you can upgrade your platform, where you can upgrade all these components. If it becomes a runtime environment, then you have to follow uh, the same release cycle. You need to make sure uh, the impact is minimized. So it becomes immediately way more complex because you are not just um, affecting the platform, but you are also affecting your uh, final product and your end, um, end customers. Is it always possible? No. There are always some components that will affect the, uh, that will be run die. One example is your container registry, right? Your container registry is always required to be up and running and uh, you cannot destroy it because otherwise if a new, for example, assuming that you're using Kubernetes, if a new pod needs to be created, that will try to reach for the container registry. If it's not available, that won't work. And then you're going to have an impact in production. So trying to move all the platform components as a build time component is going to help you from that point of view. It's going to minimize that risk. So doing that is another must, in my opinion. So principle number four, platform doesn't hide ops from development team. So what does it mean? 
again, these are all principles based on my experience and uh, my uh, philosophy of platform engineering, right? I still believe in the mantra, you build it, you run it, where we want software engineers constantly increase their, uh, their knowledge. So by giving them access to a very custom platform from, from a career point of view, when this happens to me, uh, I always ask myself this question, will I be relevant if I learn how to use this internal tool tomorrow in the market? So, and generally, unless you're working for a mega organization where the tools that they build internally will become also va valid externally. I'm referring to something like Google, Facebook, where you can see things like Kubernetes has been built internally. You learn it internally, but also lives externally. Um, React, uh, same thing. So if you are creating internal solutions, those internal solutions are kind of it's a kind of a way to see a vendor lock-in, uh, but from your employment, right? So you, you're going to end up learning technologies that are not applicable in the market. And while always learning is good, you can learn things that are also valid outside. And uh, also the documentation, all the entire process of these things is simplified because you can you can ask outside and you don't only have to ask inside. So, uh, and... Uh, with this platform should be very conscious of the fact that creating super customized solutions is not necessarily a benefit for the user. You may offer a great service, but at the same time, you may end up with a massive headache. So try to leverage whatever is available, open source um, or um, any paid product. Open source is always my preference, by the way. So in that way, what we are trying to do is to still offer a way to understand the actual cloud components instead of hiding in a way that is impossible to reapply somewhere else, right? So if you need to create a bucket, you still want to understand the principles behind the bucket. Um, if you want to create a Kubernetes cluster or a deployment or anything in your organization, you have to understand um, that some of the aspects are done for you, delegated to platform, because platform is simplifying following the internal practices uh, of the organization but everything else you still need to understand how a kubernetes deployment works how a database works all these things one of the hardest thing for a, an effective platform engineering team is to understand how to set the dial based on the current maturity level of the organization and especially of the engineering workforce and this exercise will change over time, right? So you can start with an approach that is extremely hand-holding and, and then migrate gradually to something that fosters autonomy and better engineering culture in the organization. So this is now leading to the uh, fifth principle, which is make sure every decision is reversible and everything is version. So what do I mean with this? The evolution of a platform is something that never stops. You can start with a team that has an idea and then there are new products coming from your cloud provider that invalidates or simplify your design and then you have to change to that. Same thing is your workforce, your engineering workforce um, has a different maturity over time and at the beginning, especially if they are onboarding on the cloud for the first time, you may expect a little bit uh, less maturity, but with time, uh, the engineering team will understand a bit more. They will probably ask for additional features or they will be able to cover some of the aspects done by platform. So at that point, there is no need for delegation to platform engineering. So you can start moving some of the responsibility back to the engineering teams. So this is only possible if you keep this in mind when you design the platform, you make every single decision somehow reversible. I think all of them are reversible, but at a cost. Trying to understand what is the way to minimize that cost is the work of platform engineering. This was the last principle of platform engineering. This is, uh, again, based on my experience, uh, I will probably have a few more related to the actual infrastructure as code practices and other things. Maybe I will create another video in the future about that. Let me know what you think about this video. Let me know if you agree or disagree with this so we can have 
uh, maybe a follow-up or a conversation in the comments anything you want to communicate i'm happy to get that and also learn from you thank you very much for watching and I'll see you in the next one bye